We've been raised on this philosophy of progress. American makes everything better and better and better. And to let go of that is letting go of something that's probably held at the lizard brain level. You know, yeah. it's just, it's, it's so basic. It's so fundamental. Fear of even human extinction has no, no power over me. And so I can be engaged in passionate work to make whatever difference I can make at a whatever scale I can make it. Um, but I'm not motivated by terror or fear for the insanity, the political insanity, because I now know, having studied the rise and fall of civilizations, that yeah. civilizations contract in very predictable ways. And the kind of political insanity that we're seeing, the kind of economic insanity that we're seeing is almost like, oh, right on schedule. This is what happens in this time in a declining empire, declining civilization. So that, that nourishes me emotionally, knowing that. Wow. We are so much in the same place. Thank you. But you saying it uh, brightens my day for some strange reason. <laughs> I don't know why. But uh, to know I'm not whistling in the dark, mm -hmm. but finding meaning in the dark, I guess I would say, uh, which is surely what we got to do. And I guess just the fact of how soon this appears to be emerging. Uh, yes that people aren't afraid to say, I, I haven't given it a number yet, but I hear people saying 10 years. Richard, thank you so much for joining in this, this sure. what we're calling post-doom conversation series. And this is really an opportunity to allow various thought leaders and authors such as yourself to share, well, their story, basically how they went from seeing things as perpetual progress. And yes. those of us that were born in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, yeah. to where we now realize, uh oh, that's not the future at all. And so how, how did that happen emotionally? How did that change happen? And that sort of thing. But before we even go there, I just want to, um, for those people who are watching this or listening to this, sh share a little bit about your work and your passion, what you're particularly concerned about uh, these days, and, and help people get you who don't already know you. Sure. Well, I moved here to Albuquerque 32 years ago, this month, in fact, um, to found the Center for Action and Contemplation. And our desire is to give activists and people who are working for social change some kind of depth, spirituality, and our generic term is contemplation. Uh, so they're not just knee-jerk reactors or angry liberals or whatever else. And uh, now it's morphed into a living school where we turn away 300 to 400 every year, which shows the desire for for what we're all trying to say, and yet also the the hopelessness of, <laughs> I, I don't mean hopelessness in a literal sense, but the, the fighting of the voices of despair and cynicism, you know? Yes, yes. So um, uh, b because of my health and my age, I don't travel hardly at all anymore, but I, I keep writing and uh, uh, students come here and, and visitors come here every day. Oh, I'll bet. How many books have you written? Do you remember the oh, number? Don't ask me. Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> it's only the later ones that I had the humility to ask for an editor. <laughs> I thought I could just sit down and write a book, but it's made the later ones much better sellers. Um, because just they... They notice things that I, who'm caught up in my message, don't notice very often. I think it's somewhere in 31, 32, something like that. Yeah, but that's the awesome. The early ones are transcriptions of taped retreats, you know? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, I'm, I actually, uh, 25 years ago, a long time ago, uh, no, it was maybe 20 years ago, I learned about the Enneagram. Actually, somebody gave me some oh, tapes that, of, a, of a program that you had done. Oh, yeah. Well, that was common. The Enneagram was a, a doorway for many people to the inner world, mm -hmm. uh, uh, males in particular. 
Now, you probably didn't need that, but a lot of them have never had any self-knowledge or inner experience. This rung so true that they stayed with it. It was a wonderful opening door. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, Richard, one of the other things I wanted to ask you just about your work um, is that you have way more than most people been able to maintain a, a groundedness in the tradition um, so you didn't get yourself kicked out. And yet you also have a very broad appeal among Christians and non-Christians in terms of, uh, you know, that intersection of inspiration, spirituality, science, ecology, evolution, um, inclusive spirituality, uh, integral thinking. So how did you do that practically? Because very few people have as broad an appeal as you do. I'm asked that so much, Michael. Uh, I think, and I don't use this in a pious or light way, but it's only by the grace of God that structurally I found myself protected, first of all, by the Franciscans uh, that were, were a satellite inside the Roman church. And the bishops can't really get at me. They've tried. <laughs> <laughs> they go through the Franciscans and they always support me. And then I've had at each key point uh, a bishop on my side. Like here in Albuquerque right now, we have a Pope Francis bishop, wonderful man, John Wester, who I just, he just had me over for dinner last week. Uh, he totally supports the center. So I don't know how this always happens that, uh, you know, so many guys, particularly what we would call diocesan priests or parish priests, they sort of stand naked. They, they got no structural right. protection. I have huge structural protection and it's always worked. Um, so I'm very blessed. Yes. Yes. Amen. Wow. Well, um, so Richard, coming around to the theme of this particular podcast conversation series, I want to ask about language. Um, Specifically, uh, not just sort of post doom and what that brings to mind for you, but also what language do you find helpful when speaking about this sort of contracting and deteriorating future? You know, this is going to sound naive uh, or unhelpful, but honestly, it's the radical language of the gospel. <laughs> uh, which most people have never heard. I mean, we call it apocalyptic language, and as long as it had that abstruse, pious-sounding meaning, no one had any trouble with it. Now you use a term like post-doom, and oh, conspiracy theories. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've had our apocalyptic language all along, and I think it's a necessary part of the biblical proclamation, really but it's just becoming very real in our lifetime. Yeah. I mean, it's moving out of the mythic into what's also yeah. physical, also physical and climatological and ecological. Yes. Yes, exactly. And I, I don't know if you coined it, but I I'm grateful for it because it's so honest. It's so realistic. I just gave a retreat in Santa Fe this weekend and used it several times with a whole group of uh, very academic but energized millennials, and they they found meaning in it or truth in it. Yes, yes. Uh, well, you know, it's interesting because uh, just to give you a little background, I don't think I've shared this yet on this series, is that Connie and I were in uh, Eastern Canada doing a series of programs. We did a clergy retreat and. Uh, and uh, she was communicating with a journalist who's writing a book about assisted migration, assisting trees and migrating north faster than climate, faster than any other animal can move their seed. So this whole field of assisted migration that Connie's a, a major point person. And, wow. she, and uh, there's a journalist who's coming out with a book with Norton, uh, uh, Norton Press. And she mentioned in an email, she said, yeah, Michael and I did a clergy retreat. And, uh, you know, we gave them a lot of doom, but there's only so much doom you can give clergy because they have to then go to their churches. Yes, so, yeah. she, so she said, we got to the post-doom place pretty quickly. And you know something? Post-doom has a gorgeous sunrise. 
<laughs> and, and period, that was the end of the email. And I, she read this aloud to me and I was like, post doom has a gorgeous sunrise. That's amazing. <laughs> and so then a few days later, we were meeting with some other colleagues, uh, uh, Paul Traferka and Paul Beckwith, uh, both live in Ottawa, Canada, because I was speaking at an Anglican church there. And so we floated this idea of a post doom conversation series with them and they thought it was great. And then I had several colleagues sort of question the post doom and then Joanna Macy, I, I asked her about it and she said, oh, yeah. do not change that name. I, That's exactly I, what our times call for. <laughs> I agree, Michael. Well, thank you. I agree. Yeah, that's great. Well, R Richard, please share a little bit about, you know, your story growing up in the 20th century, doing ministry in the 20th century when expectations were so much different than they are yeah, now. Endless. And yeah. how did that, how did the growing ecological awareness come into you? How did the growing climate awareness um, and overshoot or whatever, but how did you go from thinking that things were always going to be on the up and up to now realizing it's not. And what was that like for you emotionally along the way? It was slow because I held on to my Franciscan optimism. And even if I can use the word sentimentality, romantic sentimentality about the beauty of the earth and brother, son, sister, moon. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and it was almost, well, it wasn't almost, it's, it was a denial. I, this just can't be true. Uh, but as the evidence mounted, mounted, little by little, I found myself changing my language, knowing, of course, I was losing usually more than half the people in the room. Because Americans just, we've been raised on this philosophy of progress. American makes everything better and better and better. And to let go of that is letting go of something that's probably held at the lizard brain level. You know, yeah. it's just, it's, it's so basic. It's so fundamental. Uh, so my, I have to say my journey was slow. I kept putting out, as I still do, a brother, son, sister, moon, even in my new book, uh, The Universal Christ, where I try to talk about the panentheism and it probably is always going to be my approach to sacralize the earth to sacralize the ordinary uh, but it might still come from fear of appearing to be a kook <laughs> yeah. i hope not uh but it's much easier for people to stomach uh the positive message than the negative so I'm, I, I hope this weekend convinced me of it, how frequently I found myself using it. But I was with a, a very intelligent, bright group of millennials, as I said. Mm -hmm. And they're not as shocked as my generation is because they never got as immersed in the, um, in the everything's getting better and better again. Yeah, worldview. Yeah. I think that language is a huge issue, that, that the la philosophy of language was my favorite course in all my undergraduate work at yeah. Evangel College well, and my graduate work at Eastern Baptist Theological Seminary. And the, the words that we use structure our worldviews and our experience and ultimately our actions and behaviors. And by having what I would consider a trivial notion of God, a God that is merely outside this clockwork universe. Yes. We've trivialized God. We now have a limited, a finite God rather than an unlimited, infinite understanding of the divine, of ultimate reality, of primary reality. But we also desacralize the living world. We no longer relate right. to the biosphere as a That's vow right. to be honored yes. and respected. And so I'm, I'm wondering, um, I've actually started using language partly simply to sidestep traditional critiques of pantheism, panentheism. I use, yes. eco, I use ecotheism now, that all sustainable cultures, this is the claim I'm making, that all sustainable cultures, that is cultures that, that didn't degrade their resource base, that honored primary reality as primary, they did so largely because their concept of, of the divine was living, that was included or incarnate or revealed or expressed within the living biosphere. So it became 
inevitable that they would relate to what we call in secular language, the biosphere as a divine thou, as a, or at least the voice or the presence of reality, the voice or presence of the divine. However, that was mythologized. And unsustainable cultures typically relate to what we call the ecosphere, the biosphere, as merely resources yeah. and a waste and a place for our waste. Yeah. So it seems to me language is huge. And so I know that Joanna Macy, you're familiar with her work and oh, I value sure. that. She has often spoken, as did Thomas Berry and Brian Swim and others, yes. sister, sister Miriam McGillis, yes. of the universe. We've had story. all of them out here over the years. Yeah, wonderful. Prophetic yes. people. Well, Mary Evelyn Tucker, too. Uh, just amazing people who popularize the epic of evolution or the, the history of everyone and everything that God, reality, is revealing through evidence. So it's evidential revelation. Yeah. How has that big picture, how has the universe story or epic of evolution or big history, how has that informed you spiritually and ecologically? The first thing that comes to mind, and I think it's, close to the truth is that maybe I misused it. It, 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 ga it gave me optimism and hope that I didn't get, you know, I used to draw three domes, my story, our story, the story, each inside of one another. I use that a lot in my conferences. And um, because I had such confidence in the story, uh, it, it settled my own soul as to meaning, direction, purpose. But uh, I think it often made me unreal to other people who, who were so lost in my psychological story, you know, or the social dilemmas of our time. Yeah. And that continues to this day. So it worked for me to give me hope. And that's what, really what led to my last book on the universal Christ, to take religion to that universal level where it holds truth. But uh, you've probably discovered, Michael, a large percentage of people don't seem to want that or need that. They just, <laughs> it goes right over their head. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm so fascinated by it, you know, yes. because it holds the other two in context, yes. our story and my story. But um, I mean, the typical American, it's, it's only my story. And then the activists who get trapped at the second level, that the latest, uh, you know, war or whatever it is, is the whole meaning of reality too. So I've tried, I don't know how well I've done. I've tried to keep the three domes of meaning in, in context and in relationship to one another. It's worked for me. I don't know how many other people it's worked for who don't seem to need it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I've, I've been humbled, I think, in a very similar way. I was recently with um, a couple of uh, pretty well-known integral leaders and um, uh, both of them also Zen priests. And one of them mentioned that um, I was, that she was at a retreat where I was speaking eight or nine or 10 years ago now, back when I was still very much a techno optimist, where I still had a very linear human centered understanding of, of evolution yeah. and of yeah. history. And she said, yeah, you really, you know, your work really gave me hope because uh, I remember you talking about that things would keep getting better, or, you know, ex expanding yes. complexity and all. And I was sort of <clears throat> crestfallen because I had to share with her that I no longer held that worldview. No yeah. and, um, and so my way of being inspired by the epic of evolution or big history, or in fact, I don't even use big history much anymore because most of the big historians still tell that story in a very human centered rather than life centered, what I call God centered, but God G O D D E that is gotcha, life, gotcha, you gotcha. know, um, but also in a, in a, in two linear way, a, a way that was, that was um, that saw everything leading to us, but failed to see that we were part of a larger body of life. That if we didn't attend to the well-being of that body first, we would not survive into the future. And so, even though my book, Thank God for Evolution, did really well and was endorsed, you know, as you know, by lots of Nobel Prize winners and others, I don't 
sell it anymore because I only agree with 90% of it, which is still a lot. I mean, that's, you know, not uncommon, but the 10% that I don't agree with is so embarrassing to me now that I, I don't even, I don't even promote my own book. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. That's such realism and such humility. It is a marvelous book, but I guess you're right. Uh, it could leave us in a false hope that technocracy can get us there still. Exactly. And, yeah. and I, I now see that if human technology doesn't mimic God's technology, nature's technology, the universe's technology, if, if human technology Beautiful. does yeah. not align with and integrate with uh, uh, re reality's technology, nature, that technology that's emerged over billions of years, then it becomes um, almost always problematic. It just does so over time. It may benefit humans or some subset of humans in the short term, but, but it usually creates problems over the long term. For the whole, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I now consider, as you know, ecology is, is the heart of my theology. And so I now interpret everything in an ecological lens first, or through an ecological lens first, and that even in evolution I interpret through eco-theology first and foremost. Well, I support you in that. It sounds to many people like a loss of faith. It's just a, a changing of frame and language uh, to be more honest, really. But uh, those of us who are, got our degrees in theology, we're at home there, and we want everybody to keep jumping into our club using our language. And Christian clergy people in particular have made that mistake too long, I'm afraid. Yes, yes. Well, I, I, I'm, I don't fault them because I made it too. I did too. <laughs> yeah. uh, just uh, two weeks or three weeks ago, we, Connie and I, were at the Ghost Ranch, New Mexico, at the Wild Christ, Wild Earth, Wild we Self. Part, part of that, yes, yes. Yes, and um, it was really rich because here were people, most of the ministers, who were really grappling with how to interpret the core elements of, of the faith in an ecological, in sort of a green, in a green way and in a, an inspiring prophetic way that's grounded in evidence. It was just hugely inspiring to be with them at that point. In fact, all four of those, the folks that are leading that, uh, Brian, Brian, Matt, and uh, Victoria are gonna be part of this series as, as well. And oh, Brian, okay. Brian McLaren will be as well. He's gonna be a part of our faculty here in our living school. That's great. So, I, so, yeah, yeah, it's a great gift to us. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. He, he, they, we, when he and I took a long walk at Ghost Ranch, we spoke both of our, both of us spoke uh, of our admiration for you and your work. Oh. And he mentioned that he'd be meeting with you soon. Oh, good, good. Well, Richard, I want to ask a question around the past. Many of us have had to restory the past as well as the future. And I'm curious, um, have you, as you think of human history within the context of the story, the history of everyone and everything. Do you have a sense of sort of inevitability? Do you have a how do you see the divine in that? And, and also, do you have any sense like, well, if we had only not done this at that time, or if we'd not made this choice, sort of those if onlys. Uh, so how do you see the past and interpret that? Boy, that's so true that I, I, as a one on the Enneagram, who is too critical of reality. Uh, I mean, even going back to my Franciscan roots, we're always told, you know, Francis emerged right on the cusp of the trade industrial revolution. And if he had been listened to, we would have never gone down that road. Yes. Yeah. It, it <laughs> and yet we did. And I don't know how to pull it back anymore, but uh, I certainly think of that a lot with a lot of regret. And yet I've never wanted to appear, forgive me, my lack of courage as a Luddite or something, you know. Right. And yet in my soul of souls, I really feel that, you know. What, what has this profited us? Yeah. When, when, I mean, just on the human level, when I meet the amount of what I'm going to call unkindly crazies 
on the street, in the supermarket, wherever I go. Mm -hmm. Why are we producing so many unstable people? Mm -hmm. uh, it's just endemic, you know? There, there has to be a bigger reason for this. I've been saying that it's very hard to heal individuals in an unhealed culture. It's very hard to give uh, individual people hope when the whole thing appears to be going to hell in a handbag. Yes. And that going to hell in a handbag, I think the human unconscious knows it. Yes. Uh, things like this week, the Amazon burning. Mm -hmm. How much more has to be added to the equation for us to live in hopelessness? Um, yeah, it's scary. Scary. Yeah, yeah. Well, I fully agree. And that's one of the things that's now motivating me to step up. I, uh, I'm, I think you may know, uh, I recently came out last on Earth Day, uh, a, a course, a, an eight session course for study groups, for church study groups called Pro Future Faith, The Prodigal Species Comes Home. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> I, I had fun with that. Um, but the one thing that I didn't get into in any great depth in that eight session course Two parts, part one, coming home to reality, part two, um, practical wisdom. But what I didn't really get into, what I did deliver, but we just didn't include it in that series, was a reframing in an ecological context, the core elements of the Christian faith for those who are deeply grounded in that faith in, in this, our faith, and yet who have really embraced evidence as authoritative, who have embraced the divine incarnate or revealed or expressed in the living world, and who have embraced history as the progressive revelation of humans and our relationship to reality, and that hubris will lead to our destruction, and, and humility is the only path home. Uh, and so I even interpret Christ, as you know, because you published actually the last thing I wrote, which was uh, um, the f Christ as the future incarnate. Um, um, I believe that that any understanding of the Trinity that doesn't include it may not li be limited to this, but doesn't include the creator, what the past is telling us, and it was an I thou relationship to everything the past is telling us as the voice of the creator an I-thou relationship to the future as, as guide, compassionate guide and judge. Uh, and that's sort of an I-thou relationship to the second person of the Trinity. And the Holy Spirit, the, the, the spirit of reality, that is the breath and the wind, an I-thou relationship to breath and wind, ruach, uh, in the Hebrew tradition. And so I, I, I interpret the fall of Adam and Eve, for example, not as literally anybody eating an apple back then, but as dishonoring the grace limits of primary reality. And we take ourselves out of paradise and put ourselves on an inevitable path that leads to right now where we are, when we are in that hubris rather than humble relationship. And when we dishonor limits, when we no longer honor the limits that we can only take so much from the living world and we can only exude so much to the living world before the carrying capacity in ecological language is, is overshot, overshoot, and then we degrade. So I'm, I will be in communication with you as I further develop this, just because I welcome any, any input you might have. But I think this is certainly within the Christian realm, what I have the most passion for in terms of really reframing um, and, and restoring within an evolutionary ecological context these core elements. Not because I think it's going to save industrialism. I won't. I think we're going to hit the wall no matter what. But that, as John Michael Greer says, when the, when the rubble stops bouncing, assuming humans survive this bottleneck, that healthy seeds of healthy culture, healthy spirituality, health, healthy Christianity, um, ecologically grounded uh, versions of, of our faith traditions um, can, can move into the future and inspire people along the way. You are so articulate. You just, uh, you say things so well, Michael. I'm not trying to flatter you, but wow, I agreed with every sentence out of your mouth. Uh, Darn, how do we how do we get other people to see it that way? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I'm, uh, that's what I'm trying to do in this course and all. But at any rate, I want to I want to come back to something that uh, that you've written about and that you speak in a deeply spiritual way about. And 
a lot of people who speak about impermanence and death do it from an Eastern spirituality perspective. And you have integrated some of that, but you also come this from this groundedness in the Franciscan spirituality and the Western Christian tradition. So I'm curious, how has a sacred understanding of the necessity of impermanence and death, how has that informed your worldview, your own psychology, but also how does it help you look at our our contracting, deteriorating, chaotic times that we're now living in? Like all people, I uh, throughout my life, I've certainly had to struggle with why so much suffering, why so much violence, why so much death. I had to face my own death several times. This is actually the third time I've had cancer. And uh, I, I just... God very gracefully wove it into my life so I couldn't deny that this is a part of life, that, that I always felt I came out larger, freer, happier, uh, more grateful. What it, use whatever good word you want. Um, you know, I hope this is a response to your good question. I, uh, I really think, and this is what I'm trying to say in the, the Universal Christ book, that by taking the whole mystery of what I call order, disorder, reorder, death and resurrection, and projecting it almost exclusively on the body of Jesus, we lost the transformative message. You know, uh, he was the archetype of what's happening everywhere all the time, you know. And what a loss, because it, it, I think that's why, you know, at least most Catholics, when they come to church on Easter Sunday, half of them don't know it's Easter Sunday. They're <laughs> sort of, <laughs> forgive me, fellow Catholics. But, uh, <laughs> uh, it's a boring message to them, because human beings, being what they are, we're only interested in something that includes us. And uh, we had John Dominic Cross in here with us in March, where he came to the same conclusion through art that I came to through theology, you know, that resurrection and death are a universal phenomenon, uh, a necessary death and a certain resurrection. Uh, it's just, it, it makes so much more sense to people. Yeah. Uh, even though it's an equal, equally demanding act of faith to surrender to the death part, but we're coming to realize to the resurrection part too is equally difficult because mm -hmm. we don't know the shape of it. Just like we never had the clear shape of the risen Jesus. You know, what is this moving toward? Um, Everything will be all right in the end. If it's not all right, it's not the end yet. That quote from a, you know, just entertainment movie was influenced by the gospel, I believe. And it's the hope that we're burdened with because it just doesn't make sense. How is, between us, how is God going to turn around what Trump has undone? What industrialism has undone, what, uh, what capitalism has undone. It just it really seems too big to fail in its march forward. No. Yeah, well, I, I agree. And one of the things that has helped me is shifting from an anthropocentric or human-centered worldview to a God-centric, yeah. life-centered, eco-centric yeah. yes. worldview. That um, I, the way I've begun speaking about it, just as a result of the series, I've actually shared this in several other interviews, uh, conversations, is that I see doom as the midpoint between denial and regeneration, or to use Christian theological language, between denial and resurrection. Yeah. And that, that, that regeneration requires death, it requires decay, and my, my faith, my trust is so in time, it's so in 
reality as a whole, not human-centered reality, such that even if our, I mean, we will go extinct at some point, whether it's the next 10 years or the next 5 million years, we will go extinct. No mammal our size lasts forever. And so whether we go extinct in the near term or whether it's still a couple million years out before a super volcano or an asteroid takes us out, God will continue. Life will continue. Species will continue. Um, and so, so that I put my faith in that level of regeneration that even extends beyond humanity. Therefore, fear of even human extinction has no, no power over me. And so I can be engaged in passionate work to make whatever difference I can make at whatever scale I can make that. Um, but I'm not motivated by terror or fear for the insanity, the political insanity, because I now know, having studied the rise and fall of civilizations, that yeah. civilizations contract in very predictable ways. And the kind of political insanity that we're seeing, the kind of economic insanity that we're seeing is almost like, oh, right on schedule. This is what happens in this time in a declining empire, declining civilization. So that, that nourishes me emotionally, knowing that. Wow. We are so much in the same place. Thank you. But you saying it uh, brightens my day for some strange reason. I don't don't know why. But uh, to know I'm not whistling in the dark, Mm -hmm. but finding meaning in the dark, I guess I would say, uh, which is surely what we got to do. And I guess just the fact of how soon this appears to be emerging. uh, Yes that people aren't afraid to say, I, I haven't given it a number yet, but I hear people saying 10 years is, is I don't know what you're thinking. You know? Well, that's certainly, yes. I, I, I often say if whether our species goes extinct in 10 years or 5 million years, and the re, I get those numbers simply because when you pay attention to what's happening in the Arctic, especially in terms of the contracting sea ice. So much more heat is getting absorbed into the dark blue ocean, which then paradoxically causes more methane to be released, which causes more warming, which causes more methane. And if a methane burp happens, I've known about methane burps throughout Earth's history for many, many years and spoken about it. But now it's become a very real possibility that in the next five to 50 years, we could have a huge methane burp, which would increase global temperatures, say four to eight degrees Fahrenheit within a matter of a month or two. And so then you've got food belts, you know, there's only five major regions in the world where food is grown. And if two or more of them fail in any one year, you're looking at hundreds of millions, possibly billions of people starving within two years or less. So that's where sort of the, 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 the rapid self-reinforcing feedback loops that could bring about um, a, a really, truly, I mean, we're already in a mass extinction and already. most, already. most humans think that, we can, that we're not on the list, but we are quite possibly on the list. Mm-hmm. I personally think that there's also a strong likelihood that pockets of humanity will shift and that we're seeing sort of a death and resurrection uh, in, in terms of human ways of relating to primary reality. That's why I speak of the prodigal species. But we could go extinct. And, and it seems to me that part of what I'm hoping for in this post-doom conversation series is being simply in deeper conversation with colleagues and mentors such as you um, and friends who have done the heart work, have, have worked through or still in some cases are working through the stages of grieving um, and then go through the post doom doorway and then realize on the other side, there are spheres of gratitude and the W A S F that was on top of the door that kept us from going through it because we understood it as we are. So we now interpret as we are so fortunate to be conscious, to be alive and to be able to make whatever difference we can, even, even as Joanna Macy talks so prophetically about feeling our grief is a reminder of our love and our profound interrelationship with everything. And so even, even if we go extinct, being conscious of that and giving to use language that we know what it means in terms of our tradition, giving God glory, that is honoring reality in this process, I think is, is holy work, as well as assisting trees, uh, building topsoil, ensuring that our nuclear power plants don't melt down. I mean, there's many things we can do that mm-hmm. even if we go extinct, limits the harm that continues for more millions of years. And I think yeah. that's also holy work, it seems to me. 
it's so wonderful all that you've integrated that you haven't thrown out uh, a very proper sense of the divine while pe uh, speaking very astutely of scientific facts and data and information. I'm real weak on that. I, I just can never remember figures. <laughs> well, it, it, it helps being, mar being married to a world-class science writer. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, all right. Yeah, it really, really helps. Uh, all right. Well, Richard, as we begin to wind this down, I'm just, just curious, have you found... Um, um, sort of peace or finding the gift is the way Paul Traferka talks about it. On the other side of the stages of grief, beyond mere acceptance, many of us find the gift. We, 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 we are able to interpret it as a blessing in some way. And I'm curious if that's been the case for you. You know, I wonder if it isn't even, hasn't even been made a bit easier for me because it happens to be coinciding with my own winding down. Yeah. Uh, you know, a few years ago, I was given two to four years. I'm somewhere in that now. Uh, although last week I got a bone scan and they said it isn't growing at all, the cancer. So I don't know when it is. But my whole mindset in recent years is that, okay, Richard, uh, these are your closing years. And uh, my goodness, uh, my predominant emotion is without any doubt, gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. I'm 76 now. I never expected to uh, have a life one-tenth as wonderful as it has been. So uh, I guess that makes it easy for me to transfer that, <laughs> maybe too easy, to the socio-political setting that okay, I'm going to die. We're all going to die. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and it's no big tragedy anymore. The ones I worry about, and I know you would agree with me, are the little folks all over the world, you know, living in huts in the Philippines who, who don't have the background you and I have, who don't have, and are going to see all that they have built and taken seriously swept away. And of course, they'll get it first, very likely, whatever, whatever it is. It's just sorrow for them. Yes. And, and again, even theologically, you and I have a, the ability to give it meaning. And for much of the secular America, there is no meaning to this. It's rage, rage against the dying of the light, you know. And I think we're going to see a lot of that in the next 10 years. Yes. You know, more white nationalist mar marches and every little group uh, gathering into its circle of certainty and circle of protection. So, um, yeah, for me, it feels uh, fairly easy, but I can't take it easy because I've been given a platform like you have been and I got to use it as best I can. Yeah. Well, amen. I mean, I, I, I feel the grace of being so privileged in so many ways to feel the anguish of knowing that many others have been left less privileged and who are going, those who have done the least, Yes. Those who have done the yes. least to, to cause the problems are often going to be suffering the first suffering or the most. the first ones. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I'm going to be quoting you in the weeks ahead. Thank you. <laughs> oh, well, you're welcome. <laughs> well, Richard, the last question I'm going to ask um, is related to remaining opportunities. And I've been asking all of the guests in this, in this post-Doom series, what is your take on what is beyond our control and where we can still make a difference individually and collectively. In other words, what's your sense of what's no longer possible and what still is possible? Well, I think the excessive individualism that characterizes Western civilization in general, America in particular, is going to really show itself for what it is. It's an untruth about reality. And we talked about this the weekend I just gave in Santa Fe with people mostly in their mid-30s who are very bright. 
And I was amazed the ventures uh, toward what Jesus would call two or three gathered in my name, which I think was his real basic ecclesiology. Yes. Uh, uh, and, you know, even most of the millennial generation, they first thought they could do it alone and they got real well-educated and well-read and self-confident. Hallelujah. Good for them. But I, just since, I guess I have to say it, the Trump era, they've realized we got to form community. Uh, not in the big elaborate sense we friars and monks did it, or even like I tried to do in Cincinnati with New Jerusalem, what we called intentional community. There's too much uh, self-conscious community building there. Mm -hmm. I think it's just learning how to hold hands with two or three other people. Maybe it's just friendship. <laughs> yes. uh, but it, uh, that's my hope, that I see more and more people seeing a need for friendship, community, and to get out of our cocoons of isolation. The first five graduating classes here at our living school, I used to tell them in the last uh, months, you know, now, now we want you to leave here and pay back, serve the world. And I, I think it had a, that effect on many of them, some dramatically so. But I, I, this year I've changed the word from service to solidarity. Mm. Uh, choose somebody outside of your world, your group, your race, your gender, your religion, and enter into honest solidarity with them. And then whatever service comes will be a corollary of, of that solidarity. And it's received, just because I've only given it one year now, such a strong response. Um, and yet, uh, you and I both know that still sounds so puny, but I don't think it is. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. But, but it's, it's going to be a long haul. You're familiar with Ken Wilber's boomeritis and the, yeah, yes, the individualism good. and the arrogance of the mean greens. Yes, exactly. And I have to say, over the 32-year history of the center, that might be, I mean, I'm not saying they're not wonderful people, but still the tenor of as much as 50% of the people who come through here. It's still this huge chip on their shoulder about how wrong it all is. And what did I do to deserve this? And how can I kick reality into place? And uh, they don't really get the contemplative message very often. So it calls us back to the contemplative message, but all the more urgently for the sake of solidarity yes yes yeah, that's yeah. that's great really well put and i'm i'm i, I applaud that shift in how you language oh, it that, thank you. that thank really you. resonates deeply thank you michael well i actually do have one last question that sure, i want to ask sure and it's I... it it's related to if you were invited to speak either one-on-one -on -one or to a small group of say seniors people who are in their 70s or 80s but people who are retired what would be your heart wisdom to someone in their senior years? And then what would be your heart wisdom to somebody, say, in their early 20s, like a young person? Uh, just And how would that differ? What would you say to each of those uh, individuals or populations? You know, for the older group, uh, a phrase I've used ever since I started giving these male initiation rites up at Ghost Ranch. Mm -hmm. uh, was that we have a lot of uh, elderly people uh, in our society, but not a lot of elders. And I can see that this is very shocking to a lot of older people because they sort of appear to be saying, my God, that man is me. <laughs> you know, I, I'm giving my last years to golf. Uh, what did T.S. Eliot say? A thousand lost golf balls or something like that. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it, 
<laughs> yeah, and, and then the, the empty politics of so many elderly people. So I think they really need to be named in many cases as full participants in an idolatrous system that has not served humanity well, it has not served the earth well, and their own grandchildren very well at all. Uh, now there are those who push back immediately how wonderful capitalism is, how wonderful America is, and if they're entrenched there, there's not much you can do. Exactly. But there, there's always a segment who get it. Now the young, if they're not too much building their tower of success, and not too successful at building their tower of success, you have an opening. Mm -hmm. But those who are building it, you know, they're good looking, they got a PhD, uh, one beautiful wife and two beautiful children. They just can't hear you. Yeah. And uh, it makes me think this must have been the population Jesus was speaking to when he talks about the eye of a needle and how the comfortable, let's just call it that, can't get there. Yeah, yeah. So it, now there are wonderful exceptions. I have people coming through here, highly successful. I don't know if it's good parenting. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's they got wounded early and fell upward as I talked about in my Falling Upward book, but um, there are some, but most of them are those who uh, hit hit the bottom, hit the doom, as you put it, yeah. who don't believe in the illusions of the system anymore because they see how it ate them up and spit them out. Yeah. 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 So uh, I still love to preach like I was this week and able to uh, teach, I guess, more mm -hmm. uh, to young people like this. Now, these people were already on board. So, so they didn't fight me. In fact, they just couldn't wait to take it further. But you and I both know they are not the norm. Yes. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wow, this is so great, Richard. Well, any final words that you'd like to say on this theme of, of post-doom before we uh, call this conversation to a close? Well, I would just encourage anybody who's listening to you in general, these podcasts in particular, not to be put off by what you, your ego wants you to be put off by. Oh, another conspiracy theory or uh, another doomsday prophecy. Uh, I mean, we've heard that kind of language all our life and it gives people an easy out. Uh, I think we both know, Michael, there is no easy out with this. And you can call us whatever names you want, but this is progressing. <laughs> Just look out your window, look at the news. I mean, I remember when weather was maybe on the news once a month. Right, exactly. Now it's every night, weather. <laughs> and already this has become normalized. Oh yeah, America's blowing away. <laughs> I I, I remember about six years ago when Connie and I did Al Gore's training to, you know, oh, uh, you? and he, he talked about even back then that uh, turning on the evening news or the weather forecast is like taking a field trip through the book of Revelation. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. So, yeah, I think you and I both want to keep our, our love for reality, our love for, but that doesn't mean love can't include death. In fact, it does. It must. And uh, I think that's the Christian message of death and resurrection. So uh, God has given us a lot. And if we can find ways to give this, to give hope to this generation, I'm very eager to still do it. Yeah. yeah well, I'm glad you mentioned the word hope because I've begun thinking of hope like liquid. There are some liquids that will sustain us 
like water. There are some liquids that'll kill us. And so hope in itself is, is somewhat neutral. Uh, it's what are we putting our hope in, our trust or faith in? What are we hoping for? And some hopes can lead us to continue acting in anti-future ways, unecological ways. And some hopes can inspire us to downshift and live more ecologically. And so I, I think it's, I agree, a huge piece of my own ministry is trying to provide hope, but ecologically grounded hope. Yeah. Um, that's, not not hope that we're going to live on Mars uh, or yes, whatever. Yes. You say it so well. Keep saying it, really. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. God, God well, bless you. God bless you too. And, um, Again, thank you so much for your example, for your mentoring, for your older brother. I, I often refer to you as, as one of my most cherished older brothers on the path. So it's a delight to have this conversation. Very happy, Michael. Do stop by if you're in this area. And I mean that sincerely. You energize me. 